Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to moderator of the session Hybrid Threats to Democracy, Annabelle Chapman. So, welcome everybody to this uh, panel on Hybrid Threats to Democracy. I'm delighted to welcome our panelists here, some of whom are joining us virtually, who you can see on the screens, and here as well in the room with me. So um, here on the stage we have um, Mrs. Katerina Klingova from the Democracy and Resilience Program at Globsec here in Bratislava. And joining us virtually, we have, um, we have Leah Gabriel, Special Envoy and Coordinator from the Global Engagement Center, who is joining us from Washington, D.C. We have um, Veka Modebadze from the Strategic Communications Department at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Georgia. Teja Tekanen, Director of the European Center of Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats in Helsinki. Dr. Junji Lee from the Institute of National Defense and Security Research in Taipei City. And um, so please join me in welcoming all the panelists. And we will begin with some introductory remarks by the Special Envoy, Gabriel. Well, good afternoon. I'd first like to thank Globesec for hosting this fantastic event. You know, we strongly value our partnership with Globesec and we're grateful for the outstanding work that's conducted by our colleagues here. You know, I'm really honored to be able to provide the U.S. government's perspective on disinformation and propaganda as a hybrid threat to democracy and to listen and to be able to learn from my colleagues from all around the world. And I'm very proud to serve as the special envoy and coordinator of the Global Engagement Center, also known as the GEC at the U.S. Department of State. Now, for those who aren't that familiar with us, the GEC's mission is to lead and coordinate the efforts of the U.S. government to recognize, understand, expose, and counter foreign state and non-state disinformation and propaganda that's aimed at undermining the interests of the United States and our allies and our partners. So simply stated, the GEC leads the U.S. government's international response to propaganda and disinformation that adversely affects our national security and that of our allies and our partners. So our work to address the hybrid threat of disinformation takes a number of different forms, uh, from supporting counter disinformation programming with local partners, to sponsoring reports for both government and public consumption, to leading multilateral efforts with like-minded governments to counter disinformation and propaganda globally. And another key aspect of our work is exposing the actions of malign actors that target our societies with disinformation. So these actors use disinformation to threaten democracy, and they do this by taking advantage of what's really a relatively anonymous information space. You know, they falsely uh, pose as influencers, as media sources. Even some try to pose as a harmless grandma, for example, on social media, one who has oddly strong and vocal political opinions. So these actors use that anonymous information environment to push disinformation narratives that are sometimes very harmful. And sometimes these efforts happen in broad daylight. You know, I always like to remind people of something the editor in chief of RT, Margarita Simonian, said in an interview back in 2012 that was very telling. When asked why the Russian taxpayers should support RT, Simonian replied that the Russian people need RT for the same reason that they need a defense ministry. She added that, and I quote, it's impossible to start making a weapon only when the war has already started. And she even referenced Russia's war against Georgia in 2008, where she said that they were, quote, conducting the information war. You know, Simonian really uh, showed RTs and the Kremlin's intent very clearly in that statement. And this element of Russia's disinformation apparatus is certainly not slowing down, as we've all seen. So to counter these efforts from Russia and other malign threat actors, the GEC has a comprehensive approach, and this includes a number of different items. So we include using data analytics tools to provide early warnings of foreign disinformation to our allies and to our partners and to domestic stakeholders in the U.S. And we're also analyzing the attempts by our adversaries to target vulnerable audiences and sharing our information with stakeholders. We're building the technical skills of civil society organizations, NGOs, journalists, and other local actors who are best positioned to expose and counter the spread of disinformation. And we're promoting US values and norms to counterbalance authoritarian models and to ensure that the information space is not seated. And we're also strengthening our partnerships around the world to be able to collaboratively combat propaganda and disinformation. Now, we also focus on exposing the efforts of these malign actors. You know, one recent piece of exposure work that we're especially proud of is our special report titled Pillars of Russian Disinformation and Propaganda Ecosystem. 
I hope you've been able to take a look at it. This report was really the first time that the Department of State had published a really an overarching view of how Russia cultivates a disinformation propaganda ecosystem. And we delve into how Russia uses five main pillars to do that. And those are official government communications, state funded global messaging, they cultivate proxy sources, they use weaponization of social media, and they use cyber enabled disinformation to spread disinformation and propaganda. So the five pillars of this disinformation ecosystem that we've outlined work together to create and to launder disinformation narratives with some of the pillar, pillars manifesting in official, publicly visible ways, as well as more obscured and even deniable ways. Now this interaction between the different elements creates a media multiplier effect and that amplifies false narratives and it can create what we consider to be disinformation storms. And I will say the Kremlin bears direct responsibility for cultivating these tactics and platforms as part of its approach to using information as a weapon. So in addition to outlining our thoughts on disinformation and propaganda, the report provides in-depth profiles on seven proxy sites within that Russian disinformation ecosystem. And our research on these proxy sites has already enabled additional research by the counter disinformation community and has provided some valuable insights to social media platforms who have been able to take independent action to remove many of the social media properties belonging to these malign sites. So for example, uh, less than two weeks ago, Facebook removed a network of accounts that's attributed to individuals in Russia, including those associated with Russian intelligence services. Uh, the network included um, and amplified the Strategic Culture Foundation, which if you're not familiar with it, that's a Russian disinformation outlet that we detail in our report and it has links to Russia's Foreign Intelligence Services or SVR. So if you haven't had a chance to read the report, I do invite you to do so and you can download uh, that on our website at state.gov. Now, through this research, we've seen that Russia's main goal in spreading disinformation is to divide Western societies. It's also to undermine citizens' trust in democracy and democratic institutions and to inflame tensions within targeted countries. Russians, Russia's disinformation operations are often paired with other threats or action to try and further this goal. Now, turning to China, China is also very active in the disinformation space, but Beijing's goals really do differ from that of Russia in that they prioritize their influence operations to legitimize and maintain rule by the Chinese Communist Party. They also use it to set the global agenda, to remake international institutions so that they favor Beijing, and to marginalize dissent and criticism of the PRC. Mm -hmm. The CCP sees information as a tool and a weapon, and it takes advantage of open democracies and free flows of information to serve the party's aims. And Beijing has invested an estimated $10 billion in its global information strategy. Now on the surface, it may look like a soft power strategy, but some of its activities really do cross the line into what would be considered covert, coercive, or corrupting. And the CCP's decades long effort to control information within China, well, that's well documented. But what we're now seeing is that Beijing is increasingly using propaganda, disinformation, and economic and political coercion to influence conversations abroad and to try to silence its critics. Beijing's efforts to control the information environment are now going global, and we have to fully recognize the extent to which Beijing's malign actions impinge on American and European values of democracy, sovereignty, and the free flow of information. So the big question, is how should democratic societies react to these threats? And at the GEC, we're committed to our mission of leading and coordinating the US government's role within the counter disinformation community. But in order to ensure our societies are capable of both reflecting our democratic values and fighting disinformation, we believe that nations have to build a counter disinformation community of their own. So to be clear, when we say counter disinformation community, we're talking about a society-wide effort. And this has to include government, media, civil society organizations like Globesec that monitor the different elements of the Russian and PRC disinformation ecosystems, and that also use the truth to build resiliency so that disinformation is less effective. You know, we know that we need not just a government approach, but really a whole of society approach. And I know that many of our European partners are at the forefront of continuing to develop this counter disinformation community. And I want to highlight that communication among governments, among civil society, the media, and the international public really is key to making the community even stronger. 
So in the spirit of collaboration, we work with several EU and NATO partners through several collaborative platforms around global issues of disinformation and propaganda. And we've shared methodologies and analytical approaches, technologies with several partners in the EU and NATO. And we've learned a great deal from how many of our partners are approaching these similar issues so that we can share our best practices. So by continuing to build up our community, we can enable quick, efficient, and effective whole of society responses. You know, we all know how important that is, especially in light of what we've seen around COVID. And this crisis could not have made it any clearer that disinformation can impact any and every issue. Sadly, even issues that have real consequences and that affect human lives. So coordinated communications on the dangers of disinformation are critical. But we shouldn't just fill the space with warnings that, you know, while important, do increase anxiety and fear in times of crisis. We also need to be proactively filling the information space with positive and truthful narratives. While it may not seem like it, proactively promoting messages of unity or of collaboration is in fact one method of fighting disinformation. So those positive messaging, that positive message mm -hmm. can hinder malign actor's ability to fill it with lies. This messaging is best done together. And since one of the questions that we're here today to discuss is, what can be done to boost the EU and NATO's capabilities, I'd like to point to one of the very few silver linings of COVID, and, it, and that's that we came together as a community in order to counter the so-called infodemic of disinformation. You know, meetings that used to happen monthly among our institutions started happening almost daily, and we were able to very quickly exchange information about the environment. And I really believe this touches on the overarching theme of this year's forum, let's heal together. So faced with disinformation campaigns interfering with factual COVID responses and updates, we've built the relationships and we've built the mechanisms that we need to respond to disinformation crises. We're now more capable of working together to counter ongoing disinformation and whatever comes at us in the future. So the GEC greatly values both the EU and NATO and works with both institutions to build multilateral responses to propaganda and disinformation. And as we work on both sides of the Atlantic to enhance our legislative frameworks related to the threat of both dis and misinformation, we really need to ensure that our frameworks build on our shared values, including free speech, the free flow of data, and respect for privacy. So as I'm summing up my thoughts here, I want to remember that we all know that our, our adversaries are going to continue to employ propaganda and disinformation to undermine the interests of the United States and all of you, our partners and our allies. And we all know that their methods are likely to grow both in scope and in sophistication. But the GEC and the whole counter disinformation community will continue to build on its progress in developing the capacity to mitigate those destabilizing effects of disinformation and propaganda. We're going to continue to work with our allies and our partners in order to ensure that we're aligned and that information flows freely among us. So while the goal of some disinformation may be to pull our countries apart, if we work closely together, we can counter their messages in a united and a truthful manner. So thank you so much to GlobeSec and to all of you for the opportunity to speak with you. And I look very much forward uh, to hearing from the rest of the panel. Thank you very much, um, Special Envoy Gabriel. Um, we will continue the discussion now with our other panelists. And um, there will be an opportunity, of course, to respond to these themes that have been raised in these introductory remarks. And after the discussion, there will be an opportunity to ask questions as well. So you can already start thinking. Um, so I'd, I'd like to return to the context of the global COVID pandemic and how it has changed how we see these hybrid threats. Um, so a question for Mrs. Tilikainen. How has it changed your understanding of uh, the, the global threat, the hybrid threats that Europe faces at the moment? Uh, I don't know if, if it has changed our understanding, but it has provided us a model case of, of hybrid threats uh, being directed against our societies in a city where we are uh, most vulnerable. Uh, in the middle of the pandemic, when uh, the governments have uh, had to address issues of health security, the economic and financial consequences of the pandemic, of course, attention has been paid away from the, uh, the international context. Sometimes it has been difficulties uh, to cooperate with our uh, key international partners when there has been growing uh, uh, inward-looking uh, approaches uh, needed uh, to, to deal with the pandemic. So, so basically, we have learned how these kinds of, of crises 
uh, as as uh, serious as, as as this has been can be used for malign activities. But of course, uh, we should remember from the hybrid threat point of view that it's uh, we we see a whole uh, range of different instruments that uh, are being used. But of course, the final goal of these tools. This information, be it cyber attacks, attacks against uh, other forms of grid infrastructure, is to pave uh, the way for uh, for the the final goal, which is to affect uh, uh, the decision making of our societies, to to steer our decision makers to take the mal decisions. So, so really, uh, a lot going on. Uh, our our uh, resilience has been seriously. Uh, so perhaps we we get back to back to these themes. But what I want to stress is that we have seen quite an quite a number of uh, of threats around us in the uh, shadow of the pandemic. Thank you, thank you. And um, so a question for Dr. Lee: How does this relate to what you have observed in the past few months in uh, Taiwan in relation to hybrid threats and the pandemic? Um, I think, first of all, uh, the pandemic illustrated or showed how international cooperation can be fragile uh, during time of crisis. Um, in the early stage of the pandemic, for instance, many East Asian countries um, did not uh, react in a timely manner, not because that uh, decision makers did not know what to do, but because that, um, but because um, uh, they they must balance between economic performance and closing the boundaries and limiting the free flow of po uh, the populations. So, um, in the context of hybrid threats, if an adversary can manage to create a situation where um, countries are uh, forced to focus on their internal affairs and even compete against each other for those uh, scarce uh, resources, then uh, international collaboration or cooperation can be difficult. We are now in a time where everybody uh, speak about international cooperation to confront the pandemic. But let's assume that uh, if there is a vaccine that proves to be effective, then I think uh, soon uh, countries will be engaged in, in, in competition for those uh, vaccines. So I think uh, this is um, one kind of vulnerability that the, the COVID-19 uh, demonstrates. Thank you. So all the speakers so far have spoken about new vulnerabilities that have been exposed by the pandemic. And I'd like to ask you, Mrs. Modabadze, what um, new vulnerabilities, new, what new challenges has the, the, have the past few months revealed from, from Georgia's perspective? Um, thank you so much. Firstly, let me thank Lopsek and all the speakers at the panel. It is such an honor uh, for me to be uh, present today here with you. Um, the COVID pandemic indeed has challenged many aspects of our societies, including the, um, uh, including the disinformation activities in, in, in our country and in Georgia. Um, Georgia has been long target uh, of the hybrid threats. It has been mentioned that we, uh, we have faced cyber attacks in 2008. We have uh, faced it in 2019, October, and as well uh, in 2020 in the midst of pandemic. Um, the disinformation activities have, have been doubled since March uh, 2020 in Georgia, primarily addressing addressing our foreign policy and security priorities, attempting to divide the society, uh, foster the ethnic division, and challenge the, uh, the effectiveness of the government. Um, Therefore, um, uh, the, the lesson that we might take up from the from the pandemic as, as a whole society is that we need to further build our cybersecurity systems that has been already stressed uh, by previous speakers, because everything today is digital. The fact that we're um, having this conference online 
highlights the, the necessity of our cybersecurity. And we've seen the power of information in general, because nowadays in the information era, the soft power is less hierarchical, let's say so. The power lies with everyone who has access to social networks, gadgets, etc. So we have to be aware of, of uh, how powerful the information can be. And as the EU HRVP noted, the disinformation can actually kill. So this is what I've seen during the pandemic when uh, mindless conspiracy theories have been spread across the globe. And finally, to conclude, we have uh, been in under heavy disinformation attack the, regarding um, our critical infrastructure here in Georgia, Lugar Research Laboratory in Tbilisi. The uh, coordinated campaigns have attacked uh, this laboratory, questioning its activities, even questioning the origins of the virus in relation to the laboratory. And this all has been uh, officially stated by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russia as well. So all this methodology that has been already mentioned that Russia uses um, as, as a source of disinformation has been long used and tested on Georgia. Thank you. So I think one of the big themes here is disinformation, and that was actually identified as one of the mega trends in a new report produced by Globsec here in Bratislava called the Mega Trends 2020 report on trends triggered and accelerated by COVID-19. So um, Mrs. Klingova, could you tell us more about this mega trend that has been observed? Yes. Um, thank you very much. Um, for actually the possibility to be here and, and be at such a distinguished panel. Um, yes, uh, disinformation has been spread and has been with us for ages, but uh, the thing that we observed with the uh, COVID is um, the infodemic, you know, a huge increase of uh, disinformation and conspiracy theories uh, being spread uh, about the uh, virus itself and uh, about the, um, I mean, anything connected with health. Um, anti-vaccination movement uh, is having a heyday, you know, because Bill Gates is going to produce a vaccine, is going to have a microchip, and we're going to be uh, chipped, everybody's going to be chipped, and uh, without it, you're not going to be able to function. So um, it is problematic, but our societies uh, and our democracies have been vulnerable even before the um, pandemic. And this is something that we observe in our annual polling as well. Uh, we, for example, found out in March um, of this year, you know, before the uh, pandemic has, you know, uh, um, peaked in, in this region, that majority of the people really do not trust their governments. Majority of the people in Central and Eastern Europe do not trust political parties. Uh, that only in five out of ten countries that we did the polling in, uh, people prefer democratic, uh, you know, uh, system towards the authoritarian leader. Uh, so we see that our societies and democratic principles have been vulnerable way before the uh, the um, pandemic. What's problematic that during the pandemic, you need people to trust the institutions, you need people to have a, a real a good information so that they know what to do, how to act, what not to do, how to protect themselves. And this has been uh, disrupted by additional disinformation about the uh, virus measures, you know, uh, whether the masks, wearing, wearing the mask, we're not wearing masks at the moment, uh, but uh, whether, you know, uh, that kills people or not. Uh, so this is problematic and this is what we address in the uh, mega trend, but we also <laughs> focus on the economic side of disinformation because a lot of money are, a lot of people are actually making a lot of money on disinformation. Uh, and um, it has an impact, as uh, my previous uh, colleagues had already mentioned, it has an impact on people's lives. So far, I think it has been recorded that over 800 people had died on misinformation uh, that was connected on COVID because they drank bleach, uh, they drank methanol, uh, you know, so this is serious. And a lot of people are making a lot of money on it, and we need to disrupt this economy. 
um, and we need measures uh, that would, uh, you know, um, make our societies more resilient. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lee, how does this compare to the trends in disinformation that you have observed? Um, in Taiwan, especially in the course of the pandemic, I think um, Taiwan has done a relatively well job. And uh, from our experience, experiences, I think we can draw two lessons, two factors that are important to counter hybrid threats, especially uh, disinformation or misinformation. Um, let's uh, for a moment imagine that um, the virus or the pandemic was part of the uh, hybrid threat or uh, at least something similar would happen in the future. So the first lesson we learn is that we must assume that this kind of attack or, uh, or threat will be successful because uh, of the free movement of people, uh, um, capital, goods, and so on and so forth. So uh, the second lesson is that the early uh, intervention from the government is important because uh, the government uh, can establish uh, facts on the ground so as to uh, establish its own legitimacy and authority uh, to, counter the to counter the pandemic or to counter uh, mis- and disinformation. So in Taiwan, um, um, the government uh, established a central epidemic command center as early as in uh, January 20th. And our Minister of Health and Welfare was tasked to lead the command center. And uh, from January to June, he basically uh, held a press conference on a daily basis. So when people are able to see him on television at fixed time, seven days a week, and that generates a sense of trust, a sense of trust in the government and in the information or the uh, knowledge, the facts, um, the minister or the government provided uh, to the society. And um, the second crucial factor is the uh, functioning of uh, critical infrastructure, uh, critical information infrastructure. Um, our minister of uh, minister without portfolio, Audrey Town, um, helped to develop uh, an app, uh, indicating, showing a map uh, indicating the location of pharmacies as well as the stocks of mass face masks in each of the pharmacy. And uh, the point is that, uh, the point is not really how many people uh, use that app, but that people knew that the government has a solution. So together, a, a, a functioning uh, crisis management mechanism as well and uh, a normal critical information infrastructure uh, are the key factors uh, contributing to Taiwan's success. And that generates a positive circle because when people are uh, having, or when people uh, trust in the government, um, they will listen and they will pay attention to the dilemma uh, the, or the dilemmas underlying many uh, com controversial or difficult questions, such as whether Taiwan should allow uh, Taiwanese people and their children uh, working and studying in China to fly back in time of a crisis, or um, uh, whether a mass, a mass test should be conducted. So people take, uh, took part in, in this kind of debate and they, uh, they helped the government to uh, correct misinformation and to counter disinformation. So I think um, these two factors are important. And, but of course, um, if we think from a hybrid threat perspective, then these two factors will likely be the target of the adversary in the future. Thank you. I'd like to move on the discussion to the challenges of detection and attribution. And this is a question for Mrs. Tilikainen. 
how um, how difficult is it to detect these threats at the moment and specifically to to blame somebody for them uh, it is very difficult uh, many times and, and this is uh, of course the asset uh, of the adversary is that they use it's it's very difficult for for our democratic societies to to respond to threats uh, where the uh, responsibilities behind are, are not that uh, obvious. Uh, we want to uh, rule of law, law system. Uh, so attribution and detection uh, is the key uh, in order uh, to, to be able to uh, use some countermeasures. And, and at the same time, it's, it's difficult. Uh, but I also uh, wanted to get back to, to what Dr. Lee said, because I found it extremely uh, uh, to maintain uh, the credibility of uh, the government in a situation where, it, where the, and the whole society uh, is the target of a, a huge disinformation campaign. Uh, we might uh, be, have difficulties with, uh, with attribution, we might uh, have difficulties with our, our to deter uh, disinformation and that's why uh, to maintain the resilience of our societies, a healthy information environment by supporting uh, traditional media and, and journalism to make sure that uh, our societies have uh, a solid information base to rely on and also uh, the, uh, in, in that way uh, the uh, credibility and uh, f firm position of the government uh, can be maintained. That, that is very important, in my view, in, in the context of, of uh, difficulties that we might face with attribution. Thank you. And uh, so a question for uh, Mrs. Modebadze. How important is strategic communication in this context and what narratives have you been promoting at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in, in, in Georgia? Uh, well, today's information environment is the following. When there is a vacuum information, it will be uh, filled with weaponized information, disinformation. And when there is room for interpretation, then there is uh, room for alternative truths. So we need strategic communications to harmonize and coordinate our messages within the hierarchy of the communications layers that we have within the government. And uh, we need to affect both domestic and external audiences. Uh, the issue with Georgia is that uh, we have um, uh, disinformation campaigns affecting uh, uh, the society within the country. Uh, while they, uh, the, the campaigns also try to portray Georgia as a nation that continues to fail and implement democratic reforms and uh, a country that bears uh, security threats and which hinders obviously our European and Euro Atlantic integration. Um, now, strategic communications is, is a tool that needs to be pushed step forward and to give it the merit that it deserves to, to unleash its true potential. The, uh, uh, the information crisis has fully demonstrated the need of tra uh, tra uh, strategic communications. And uh, um, it has been already mentioned that government uh, needs to um, uh, implement an effective communication like we did during the pandemic in Georgia. We've also established an interagency coordination council headed by the prime minister himself. And we also had almost daily briefings for our society to ensure them that they they were taken care of and government was there, there for them. Uh, the well-informed citizen is a key to the resilience and deterrence that we have been talking about and the government of Georgia fully understands the significance of this principle. Um, Unfortunately, our adversaries, um, Russia in particular, has been constantly inter uh, inventing new tools and new methods to undermine our, our development and our reforms and our credibility on the global scale. Um, what the Ministry of Foreign Affairs does is the proactive communication that has been already mentioned. It is essential that we don't leave the space for interpretation. Uh, we have information center in EU and NATO that reaches out 
close to the regions and with the kind assistance of the US State Department actually has an amazing project to, to um, educate our societies against this information. We have our embassies working on a daily basis abroad promoting Georgia's positioning and communicating our, um, our achievements and progress within the country. Thank you. And so we've discussed the experience of various countries and I'd like to move on to the challenges for the EU and NATO. And how could these two organizations improve their strategic communication efforts and broader support for countries' resilience? It's a question for, yeah, for Ms. Klingova. Um, I think that um, European Union and NATO need to strengthen uh, their strategic communication capacities um, both uh, at regional and national level. Um, I, you know, we're in Slovakia, um, Minister of Foreign Affairs has a dedicated strategic communication unit, which consists of four people. At the moment, this is the uh, only strategic communication unit at the, the ministries in Slovakia. So you, and when you compare it, there are over 1,800 uh, 1, uh, disinformation actors spreading disinformation actively in Slovakia on a daily basis. So four people, one institution cannot really combat uh, these um, malign actors spreading uh, disinformation in Slovakia. Um, we need to uh, increase the capacities and budget of the European Union focused on strategic communication. When you take into consideration that the, the budget of the East Stratcom task force uh, that deals with the Russian disinformation is 5 million, and compare it to the resources that the um, you know, Russian state-sponsored media have, which is 260 times bigger uh, than the budget of the EU task force, then, you know, there's no comparison. I mean, we are already losing. So we really need to increase the capacities, both, um, both personal, uh, but we need to invest more money into it. And we need to, um, you know, educate people how to communicate because proactive communication, strategic communication is not something that uh, a lot of people know of, um, you know, um, a lot of uh, public representatives, also civil servants, you know, they don't even consider that communication uh, with public on a daily basis should be part of their uh, job. So uh, we need to show them, um, we need to educate them in the new technologies, uh, new social media, which are popping out, you know, not a lot of uh, institutions have had in the past uh, um, social media uh, accounts where majority of the, the populations in Europe or all around the world are getting more and more their information from. You know, you cannot really post a press release uh, and on your website when nobody is actually going to your website <clears throat> and when they get most of their information from social media. So these are the things that we need to work on. Uh, we need to coordinate our efforts. We need to coordinate our narratives uh, that we're going to be uh, pushing forward. We need to produce um, the messages, not only in English, but we need to push them in national languages so that uh, we can um, you know, push them to national target audience and they realize what it means to be part of EU, part of NATO, and they can, uh, you know, personalize it, uh, you know. They mm -hmm. And um, to, to follow up on this, uh, Mrs. Tilikainen, what improvements would you like to see at the European level in terms of strategic communication and responding to hybrid threats? Uh, well, the, uh, the European Union is doing many things, and I, I, I truly appreciate all those efforts. But I, was, I would also put, a, put more responsibility on, on the states because I wonder if there is a full awareness of how, how we use this unity is being used against it uh, by the adversaries. So we, I think, unnecessarily let uh, our small uh, disagreements in the EU dominate our, our uh, strategic narrative, uh, it's very easy uh, for external actors to take advantage uh, of these cleavages with, within the EU dividing lines. 
So I think we should uh, strengthen to strengthen awareness about uh, how how these uh, small these are being used against us should lead to a better understanding of the value of of our unity and also communicating that unity both to our uh, societies and and to external actors. But but as said, uh, the EU really within a couple of years. Uh, in, in, in many uh, policy fields has, has started to do a lot more uh, to provide a joint uh, uh, response to, to many forms of threats. And, and uh, like, the, like NATO in its field, the EU is, of course, a capable actor for that as uh, it has tools and instruments available for a, a joint reaction. And it's better to do that at the collective level rather than than to do it uh, in, in the member states. Thank you, and we're going to move on to the questions soon, but before then I would just like to ask um, two of our panelists to share some best practice from their country. Um, Mrs. Modabadze, what can other countries learn from Georgia's experience of um, tackling hybrid threats, specifically? Thank you. Um, Georgia, like I said, has been targeted of, of hybrid threats for a long time. And I believe even NATO has already made a great progress in this regard uh, when we're talking about um, um, addressing the, the hybrid threats because the, the problem, we have to recognize the problem in order to address it. Um, uh, since it's not new for us, we've been able to detect the methods that the, the Russian disinformation uses or hybrid interference methods you are being used. Um, we also have the skill that um, enables us to have more prompt reactions because uh, in the information environment we have to be proportional and we have to be um, imminent when it comes to the reactions um, to the to the hybrid threats uh, when it comes to to the resi resilience and deterrence it is important that we study uh, we share the experience and we learn from the other countries as well we try to communicate with 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 our partners who have the same experience and who have the capacity uh, that we can we can learn or we can share with them. Um, uh, the analysis and uh, understanding is crucial in order to um, um, address this this um, uh, threats. Um, however, it has been noted as well uh, that the these threats are evolving quite rapidly. So we have to keep up. We have to be on time. We have to be uh, focused and sharp and be assertive in our responses. Uh, what is also very important is to uh, uh, share the, the, the information and data and intelligence, which could, be, which could be challenging, obviously, for some countries. But when it comes to this common threat, it is important to coordinate and, and to cooperate on this matter. Um, and one more uh, important thing, thing from Georgian experience is to have all the stakeholders involved in this, in this um, process let's say, because it's not just the state actors, but as other countries are also doing, is we need to involve the civil society. We need to um, shake some university departments and get their attention when it comes to, to uh, media literacy or, or awareness in general on, on, on hybrid threats. Um, so the, the, the point being made is that we have to work on our uh, resilience. We have to be timely and we have to be very inclusive when it comes to addressing them. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Lee, you've already told us a lot about uh, Taiwan's experience, but is there one sort of crucial insight you would like to share that other countries can learn from? I think uh, the principle is that it is important for the government to have uh, an upper hand in the infosphere. And to do this, um, the best way is to uh, be are transparent and to provide the society with all the information they need. Because uh, in modern times, um, people are smart enough, they will figure out all those information they need. So um, if, if they find something that the government provides with them is not uh, correct or is problematic or even tries to uh, cover up, then it will undermine the government's uh, credibility. So uh, transparency is 
I think, uh, the best uh, practice. And, and that will also uh, uh, bring the society in uh, with the government. Thank you. So now I'd like to open the discussion up to some questions, starting here with the audience in the room. The way this works is you can raise your hand to ask a question, and then um, because of sanitary regulations, to go up to the microphone that's over here and ask your question for one of the specific panelists or more of them. Does anyone have a question? Come on, d d don't be shy. <laughs> If there are no questions so far, then I will um, continue returning to the, to the panelists. So um, this strange year, 2020, is coming to an end. And um, I wanted to ask each of you to sort of outline what the main challenges will be for, for 2021 and for, for the years ahead, perhaps starting with um, uh, Mrs. Uh, Tilikainen. Uh. There are certainly plenty of challenges, but uh, there is one concern that I would like to raise, and, and it is uh, the concern with our democracy from that point of view that uh, we are having difficult times uh, uh, due to the consequences, the economic consequences of the pandemic uh, globally, and as, uh, also our, our democracies might uh, uh, grow of internal polarization uh, due to the to the uh, frequencies of, 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 of the pandemic. so we have uh, in a way uh, we have to deal with the the high external hybrid threats uh, which uh, cause ace on on our on the unity of our our societies uh, and our western community at the same when there are serious internal uh, factors challenging uh, the same thing, so leading to polarization and instability uh, soci societally. So, so this is this is something which I think is is one of the most comprehensive challenges for next year. And how do you expect things to develop? Um, of course, we don't know what will happen with the pandemic, but um, what um, what should democracies be paying attention to specifically in the months ahead? This is following so up. We um, have learned a lot. Yeah, we have learned a lot, of course, during the crisis uh, about our vulnerabilities. We have learned uh, that we should also defend uh, our democratic model. Uh, it has been uh, attacked and challenged. Uh, so, so uh, th this is uh, on, on the more positive side. We have uh, th there are lessons that we have learned, but there are sti still difficulties ahead. Uh, of us, and uh, that's why I can uh, only stress the value of cooperation, cooperation within the uh, co cooperation with the transatlantic community. Uh, we are much stronger also uh, with this challenge, uh, the challenge against our democratic model, uh, when the difficulties uh, get get harder. So uh, this could be one of, of, of my messages to this audience. Thank you. And Mrs. Klingova, how, what challenges do you anticipate in 2021 in terms of countering hybrid threats? I expect that um, our societies are going to be more and more polarized and uh, various foreign actors are going to use this polarization unless we start to, you know, um, have public discussions about issues, topics that might be problematic or polarizing. We need to openly talk about uh, our values. We need to possibly dial back uh, and, and talk about what does it mean um, to be living in a democratic society, uh, because democracy is not a checklist. And we have to work on our democracies on a constant basis. Um, and some of the narratives that have been spread by, um, you know, Russia or China have been trying to prove that their regime is much more better in dealing with pan the pandemic uh, and pointing out how basically our democracies are falling apart. Um, yes, we have problems and we need to acknowledge them. 
um, but uh, we can, I think, make it better. Uh, and I fully support uh, the ideas that were voiced by my uh, fellow speakers that um, we need to cooperate together, uh, whether on the EU level or NATO level, because we can uh, achieve way um, better things and uh, things much more efficiently if we are um, working together. Um, I assume that um, conspiracies and disinformation are going to be uh, you know, thriving and are going to be uh, spread on a constant basis, especially uh, if we're going to have the vaccination. Um, the anti-vaccination movement is definitely going to, I mean, oh, it's already, but it's just going to amplify their narratives. Um, we need to scan the horizon for future challenges. We need to do um, mapping of our vulnerabilities and try to patch the um, gaps as soon as possible. Uh, we need to, you know, broaden our horizon of the threat perceptions and th security perceptions. Uh, we need to increase the resilience of our um, critical network, including hospitals, which have been the targets of security attacks and breaches uh, during the pandemic. You know, it, it's, it can be assumed that this is going to be just um, enhanced and it's going to be continuous. Um, you know, we need to sit down behind the table and uh, objectively reevaluate like what have we done uh, in a good way and where have we failed during this pandemic and um, not be able to say that we had made mistakes but you can learn from those mistakes and uh, unless we acknowledge those mistakes we can you know move forward and and uh, patch those gaps thank you and um, dr. Lee I want to ask how is Taiwan preparing for the months ahead with all this uncertainty about what's going to happen with the pandemic well, in terms think, of hybrid um, threats? So yeah. far, yeah, so far the pandemic is not in Taiwan a, a, a very big issue. But um, if we uh, speak from the perspective of hybrid threat, I would say that um, economy, economy will be a challenge in the, in the coming year. And I say that because um, many countries in the world, uh, including European member states, EU member states, um, uh, state uh, in their strategic papers that um, things like uh, uh, we don't want to take sides between the United States and China. Uh, we, uh, we still value uh, the trade relations between uh, the, the home country and China and so on and so forth. I know these are uh, reasonable arguments, and I fully understand. But um, if we talk about uh, strategic communication and hybrid threat, isn't saying so um, also exposing our own economic vulnerability to the adversary? I mean, in other words, are we saying to China or in other or other adversaries uh, things like, "Yeah, we we are." cautious about your intention about your use of hybrid threats against us but we still need your market we still need your resources we still need your um you know uh, labor and so on and so forth so i think in 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 this way it is it is not uh, 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 in this way it also gives uh, the adversaries uh, a leverage to use uh, hybrid threats against us Thank you. And a question for Mrs. Modabadze. What will Georgia's main message going forward be in terms of communicating to domestic audiences in the context of the pandemic and hybrid threats? Well, pandemic has created a fertile ground for adversaries to instill the despair, distrust, confusion among uh, the societies and within the government as well. Um, from uh, Georgia's perspective, starting from the very beginning, the priority for the Georgian government has been to address the pandemic and manage the health situation, but also to fight on another front, which is economy. Because at the end of the day, 
when when you ask people and when you 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 try to find out their interests obviously it is the economy that they're interested in so this is another issue that will probably lead to frustration internal polarization that has been already outlined by other panelists um, and for this we have uh, we need transparent and honest uh, conversation with our societies and we have been having meetings with different um, uh, stakeholders and different uh, groups because some uh, groups have been affected uh, more than the others um, and actually one of the principal narratives of Russian disinformation in Georgia during this whole period has been that Georgia's economy is in collapse and we won't be able to survive this pandemic so um, we are a failed state a failed nation um, obviously in the coming months whatever the pressure points will be it will be exploited by the uh, adversaries let it be the upcoming election let it be the vaccination, because obviously the, the, the um, uh, development of the vaccine will lead to another uh, infodemic, uh, new wave of inf infodemic. Um, and we also expect the continuation of clandestine diplomacy. Uh, for this, we need to talk with our partners. We need to have um, uh, honest uh, exchange of information and uh, coordination on, on ways to go further. So our uh, aim is to keep the solidarity amongst our society keep the solidarity with our partners and together as partners uh, and in cooperation we will move forward. Thank you. So I'd like you to join me in thanking our all our panelists um, starting with Special Envoy Gabriel for her introductory remarks and then the other panelists um, for the interesting discussion and for joining us from so far away virtually and here in Bratislava. So thank you. Thank you. And, um, and before you leave, I'd just like to say that in five minutes, um, the discussion will continue here with a session on climate imperative in the economic rescue. And you can also go to the Maria Theresa room um, across the hall for a session on the EU in the digital age. Thank you. Thank you.